For this cause, what cause? What cause? For the cause of hearing, in verses 1 through 8, Paul is in prison, guys. Paul is in prison in Rome. He's 1,311 miles away from Colossae. His buddy Epaphroditus starts the church in Colossae. And Timothy is, is, is there with him. Timothy is, is his friend that comes to visit him in prison and stuff. And he's the liaison going back and forth, taking the message, taking the word, dropping off the letters and, and other things like that. And so he, he encourages the, the group itself there in Colossae, hey, let's listen to Timothy when he comes along, when he comes around your area preaching. Timothy's got some good stuff to say. And uh, if Paphrodite's our brother, you know, check him out and da-da-da-da, all this other stuff. And so, but he says this. He says, what really impresses me when the boys come to visit me and they told me about the new church there in Colossae, is I heard how immediately you guys heard the word and your faith in the Lord was solid. You believed that Jesus was God, that he was who he said he was. He's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob made flesh, the word dwelling among us. You guys believed that. And then you went farther than just hearing that and kind of believing it on your couch. You went and did something about it. You went and you loved people out of a genuine heart. And he says, I've heard of your faith toward God and your love toward others. Guys, this is Christianity in a nutshell. Loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and loving your neighbor as yourself. You know your faith is activated when you've got off your couch. Now, many times, God will leave you on your couch to meditate, to study, to pray. That's where most of our stuff is, on our knees, in our closet, in quietness. That's where you grow in your one-on-one -on -one with the Lord Jesus Christ. Sometimes it's good to get away from the crowd. We have an... Uh, Opposition to that idea. A lot of folks today is like, you know, the church always done me wrong. I don't got no church to go to. And, and they're fairly right, guys. It's like in America today, about the only church you can find is Laodicea. The sinful, lazy, lukewarm, not off their couch church. They kind of believe the doctrine about Jesus, but they don't hang out with Jesus. And that's why Jesus is busting on their door, knocking on the door. Will you please let me in? All God wants, guys, relationship with Jesus Christ is relationship with Jesus Christ. Salvation is believing in Jesus Christ, and sanctification is walking with Jesus Christ. You let him in the door and say, come on, let's go. What do you want to do today? And many times he'll keep you there silent, quiet, by yourself in meditation and prayer. Because he can do a whole lot more with you out of the way. He can do a whole lot more with me out of the way. Many times we want to get in there, and sometimes we'll see a person on the street who's asking for money, and God doesn't want us to give him money because he's a shyster. Or God doesn't want me to give him money because God is working in his heart and God wants to humble him. And he doesn't want me to bring him out, out of the humbling. Many times we get in the way of God because we're not sensitive to God. And it's important for us to walk with him, listen to his voice and say, hey, what do we do? We don't always help everybody out. We stay sensitive in prayer and say, Lord, what do we need to do? Because sometimes the Lord says, I need you to leave that one alone. And sometimes he says, I need to get, get up and go to Kmart. And you're like, why am I going to Kmart? Just get to Kmart. You'll find out when you get there. The Lord leads us in our hearts. He leads us in our lives. And so we need to listen to him. And he tells these people at Colossae, he says, you're that kind of folk, man. He says, you're the kind of people who believe in the Lord. And you're also the kind of people who love people. You've taken it a step farther than this. You being saved. And I'm so glad I'm saved. Now I get to go to heaven and live my life and do whatever I want. But you've invested your life into other people. Guys, this is true Christianity. True Christianity is living sacrifices, investing yourself into the lives of other people. And Paul tells us, he says, for this cause, hearing about this, since the day I heard of this, since I first heard of this, the boys came back to my prison cell, to my jail cell here in Rome, 1,000 miles, three, 311 miles away. They told me about your situation, and I have not ceased praying for you from then on. You guys, if you get bored in Christianity, it's because you're sinful. If you get bored in Christianity, it's because you're lazy. If you get bored in Christianity, it's because you're disobedient. If you get bored in Christianity, it's because you have lack of self-control. You're not producing the fruit of God in your life. You're not allowing it to be produced in your life. And that's all Christianity is, and that's all God's looking for is fruit in our lives. 
You see, the ultimate fruit is not love, joy, peace, long suffering, da, da, da. Those are characteristics to bring in the real fruit, which is people, souls. God is interested in souls. And everything we do is to bring glory to God and to win souls. And he that winneth souls is wise. God's called us into wisdom. He's called us away from foolishness, man. He doesn't want us to be partakers with fools. Uh, he gave us a whole book of Proverbs talking about fools and wisdom. He, he gave us New Testament talking about, um, in the book of James, you know, what wise men do, what is satanic wisdom, and what is godly wisdom. There's such a thing as street smarts and heaven smarts. God wants us to understand heaven smarts, heaven wisdom. And that is hanging out with God, listening to his voice, doing the things that he says. It's bearing fruit. But God uses the characteristics of the fruit of the spirit, the love, the joy, the peace, the patience, da da da, da. And that is fruit being born in our spirit, in our inner man. So we can go with that inner man and go to the outer man, to people outside this this wall, the, this door, and go talk to them and be this fruit production in their lives, this thing that sustains them, the thing that refreshes them, and th the thing that wins them. Do you know you'll win more people with love than you will hate and bitterness and being fearful and potty mouth? Joy. You'll win more people with joy than you will with misery. How's your day? Oh, it sucks. My day just, oh, it's horrific. Well, you know, we all have bad days, but you're going to have a terrible, awful day if you ain't walking in your misery with Jesus. Because in the presence of God is the fullness of joy. The reason you're having a bad day, everybody has bad days, but there's some people who have joy, joy in their bad days, and there's people who don't. The ones who have joy in their bad days are the people who are walking with God. Every step that they take. Hey, those boys going to the fire, that wasn't a good day for them. It ended up being the best day of their life. Because they walked in with Jesus, they walked in the fire, continued to walk with him, and they walked out of there with him. I see a fourth man as the son of God. Man, that's crazy. <laughs> and it witnessed unto the king. It witnessed to everybody there. Their faithfulness. They're walking in the fire. And so God wants us, our whole life, guys, is walking through fire. God's trying to get rid of you. He's got to burn you away. You've ruined everything up to this point, right? God says, we've got to get rid of you. We've got to have the reflection. We've got to have the fullness of Jesus Christ in you, dwelling in you richly. We, we got to have everything about God in you. Get rid of you. Get rid of your game plan. Get rid of this world. Get rid of everything. Love not this world, neither the things that are in this world. If you love this stuff, you don't get it. If you don't, if you love this stuff, the love of God is not in you. You don't get it. Do you not want the love of God in you? If the love of God is in you, that's how you're tapped in. You're abiding in Christ. You're abiding in His love. You're, you say, Lord, I detach myself from the ways of the world. I detach myself from the philosophies of this world. I detach myself from the rudiments, everything of this world, what they desire, what they crave. And I'm going to attach myself to you, and I want only what you have for me. Paul said, I heard that about you people there at Colossae. That's the way you guys are. That's what the preacher boys come back and told me. When somebody asks your preacher about you, they throw your name in the hat. What's your preacher going to say about you? I say the same thing these boys told Paul. I thank God for you guys. I thank God you're here, you're faithful, you walk, you come back, you got questions, you get knocked down, man, and you don't stay down. Because the Bible says righteous men, just men, get up seven times, eight times when they fall seven. You're going to fall. Guys, Christianity is not not falling. Christianity is getting up when you have fallen. Amen. Christianity is continuing on. And Paul says, I heard this about you guys, man, and since then I have not ceased to pray for you. You need to not be bored. You need to get busy praying. Because I'm here to tell you, when you start slaying demons and the devil with the sword of the Spirit, they come and at you, and there's nothing boring about that. It gets long and arduous, it, it, gets, it gets horrific, it gets heavy, but it ain't boring. When you're in spiritual warfare, and we are to continually be in spiritual warfare, because your flesh hates your spirit, and your spirit hates your flesh, and your flesh hates God. And we got to kill that guy. we got to detach your flesh. We gotta get rid of that flesh. We gotta get rid of our old ways, our worldly ways, everything that's drawn to this planet. And we need to have the mind of Christ in us. We need to be setting our affections on the things above in heaven and think heavenly and know what's godly. And when you begin to read that word, boy, it begins to shove all the old out and replace itself with the new. And you'll find a joy and you'll find a peace and you'll find all the fruit of the Spirit coming in. The stuff you've been lacking is found in that word right there. It'll refresh you and it'll bring joy to you. And he says, since I heard about this, I have not stopped praying for you. And to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will. Wouldn't you like to know God's will for your life? Wouldn't you like to be filled with that? Would you like to get past the place where, I wonder what I should do here. Should I do this or should I do that? Should I do this or should I do that? Uh, I have people talking to me all the time about the will of God. And, and they got all this stuff going on. And, and do, I, do I what? Do I do this? Do I do that? I got this stuff going on. Da, 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 da. 
Keep doing what you're doing. Don't stop what you're doing. If God called you and you know you're doing the right thing now, you keep doing it, and a storm will come in, and the offense will come in, and the earthquake will shake, and the fire will burn, but you're waiting on a small, still voice. Don't worry about all that other stuff. You wait for the small, still voice. And Satan wants to bring all this other stuff and noise in to cloud out the small, still voice. And your battle is, Satan, shut your mouth! I need to hear from God on this thing. i got to tell you. And guys, don't do anything until you hear from the small, still voice. Don't do a thing. Keep doing what you're doing. Keep walking faithfully. And don't let Satan make you worry, should I, shouldn't I, should I, shouldn't I. Just keep doing what you're doing until you hear the small, still voice. And he begins to pray, and I pray for you, and we pray for each other, that you might know the entire full will of God, God's desire for you. It's made it real simple. His desire for you is for you to learn to sit quietly at his feet. It's not doing things, it's not partaking in things, it's not joining different committees, and this other stuff. It's learning to sit at the feet of Jesus, Jesus and knowing who he is, his personality, everything about him. He's made it simple. We make it hard because that doesn't seem like it's getting much done. Just sitting at the feet of Jesus don't seem like I'm getting much done. Because I'm a doer, see, I, I, gotta, get, I gotta get stuff accomplished. I, I, I'd rather God do the accomplishing than me. Because I can work all day long. Do you think God can lift a whole lot more than you can lift? Do you think he can carry that burden a whole lot farther than you can carry it? Do you think that? We might as well let him do that. That's why he's here. That's why he's the oxen in the other yoke, man. He's to pull this cart. He's the lead ox. He's doing the work. We're just right, right alongside of him to keep this thing balanced. He's invited us alongside of his work. He's doing the work, guys. It ain't something that he's waiting on you to accomplish. It's something that he's inviting you to help him accomplish. He's doing the work. If he ain't doing the work, you're doing it in vain. You're going in circles. You're working endlessly for nothing if God's not doing the work. So we've got to wait on God to do the work, and we just go according to with him in the yoke. And we write it out, and Paul says, I am praying for you, I pray for you, and we pray for each other, that you will know the entire full will of God. And Satan won't have you spinning your tires. Oh, there's a fire. There's an earthquake. I need it all quiet so I can hear your voice, Lord. And I ain't going to change anything because I'm steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord until I hear your small voice say something different. Amen? A devil will come in and he's tried to be a ventriloquist. He can't mimic God's voice too well. God's voice is small, still, assuring. And it's always in concert with his scripture. That's why we impress on you to read that scripture, know the scripture, hide the scripture, because God's voice harmonizes with his word continually. He says that you might be filled with all the knowledge of his will and all the wisdom and spiritual understanding. I pray that for you. I pray that you'll read the Bible and you'll know it. You'll hear God's voice. He will teach you in things. He will replace your, your old thoughts and your old tendencies with his thoughts and his tendencies, his will, his knowledge. Guys, you've got to know it. It's life-changing when you read the Word of God and find out you've been doing something wrong or thinking wrong. And you go, whoa, and it's epiphany. You say, Lord, no, that's got to change today. And the Lord's heart becomes your heart. His mind becomes your mind. His thinking becomes your thinking. His ways become your ways. And that is the whole purpose. And that's where joy comes from. Misery comes from doing just the opposite. When we try to take care of things, when I try to fulfill my happiness, you guys understand that happiness in the world demands money and, and it demands repetition. If I'm going to have fun next weekend, it's going to take my money, in most cases, and it's, I, then if I want it next weekend, i got to do it again, and if I want it next weekend, i got to do it again. It's repetition, 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 and it never brings ultimate fulfillment. It never brings ultimate joy. And Paul is praying, he's saying, I want you guys to find all that. I want you guys to find the perfect will of God. I want you to know that, and I want you to understand that, and I, I want you to know that the greatest riches you can have is knowing God, knowing His Word, knowing his heart, and having it hidden in your heart. There's coming a day in the world soon that they're going to get rid of every Bible. They're going to get rid of every audio tape. They might just do that with a button. Get rid of all electricity. They're going to get rid of every Bible. And the only Bible that the people here will have, I don't know if it's going to be before the rapture or after the rapture, but the only Bible you're going to have is what's in your heart. What's in your head. That's all you're going to have. And Satan has been working all your life to keep that from happening. It's time for you to wake up and say, what's important to me? Jesus said, God told us that there's coming a day when there will be a famine. Not for food, but for his word. Because the word will be gone, and the only word that will be left is what's been locked up and shut up in your heart. You know, Marshall was talking about that today. We've 
all our lives we've memorized different songs, and we've memorized poems, and we've di lines from movies, and all this other stuff. What about the Word of God? I had a Freemason talking to me kind of in pride and how much he's had to memorize. I've had to memorize this, and I had to memorize that. I'm all the way, all the way, man, I'm 32nd degree. Uh, guys, that is a ton of memorization. And this guy was in my office in a counseling session because his family was falling apart. And I asked him, how much Bible do you have memorized? That's the difference. We spend our time memorizing all this other stuff that destroys our family, that won't help our family, when the important thing is knowing the Bible, knowing the Scriptures. Because to know the Bible is to know Jesus. He's the Word made flesh. And it's important that we know Him. It's important that we meditate on Him, sit at His feet. And Paul says, I have heard about your awesomeness. <coughs> it needs to continue. So I've started praying that you'll continue doing that. Just because you're doing it today doesn't mean you're going to do it tomorrow. You have to watch out. You have to look out because that enemy, the devil, is coming about to devour you. Because you're walking in the Word and you're loving people today, it doesn't mean you're going to be doing that tomorrow. Don't ever think you got it and you've got it figured out. Pray for yourself, pray for others, man. And Paul, he says, man, I need you. I'm praying that you will grow in wisdom and in the knowledge of God. That you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in that same knowledge. I want you walking worthy of the Lord. What is that? That is, God has set us on a walk, and his word says one thing, and our walk matches his word. That's walking worthy. It's not doing something else. Lord, be, as I walk your word, may I do it just right. May my dance steps be right. And may my one, two, three, four be in time with you, Lord. I want you to be pleased with my dance, with my song, with my little thing, my game. That ain't it. Being worthy, walking worthy is seeing that word of God and taking that next step even when it looks, oh, I don't want to take that step. I'm going to have to get rid of stuff in my life. There's going to have to be circumcision of the heart. There's going to have to be stuff cut out of me. But the word says to do it and I'm doing it. I'm walking worthy of the Lord Jesus Christ. He says that you might walk worthy of the Lord Jesus Christ unto all pleasing. Don't you want to please him? Don't you want to please him? This church here was pleasing him. The church here was doing the right thing. They love God and they love people. And he says, now you need to continue in that. Because what's going to happen, guys, it happens to everybody. When you first get saved, there's this dun da da dun da 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 It's wonderful. You've been freed. You've been freed. And then you walk the path for a little while in the world. And you're walking with a bunch of people who don't believe. And you're walking with this stuff. And we get dull. And we get duller and duller until boom. There's nothing there. We need to pray continually for each other. Lord, sharpen my axe, help me out. I want to know you. I want to walk in your power. I want to do everything and every good work. And I want to increase in the knowledge of God. Verse 11. Strengthen with all might according to his glorious power. I want to be strengthened. Everybody wants the power of God in their lives. Churches today, guys, the church today is so wrong. The church today is wicked. They have stopped following Jesus. The church today, and man, I'm... We, I got into this too. The, that whole prayer of Jabez thing. The whole prayer of Jabez is an Old Testament character praying, Lord, that thou would bless me. You'd enlarge my borders, enlarge my coast, keep bad things from happening to me, blah, 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 blah. And that's what the New Testament church has continued praying. And it's an automatic blessing. If you'll pray this, this, but that's not the will of God. That was the will of God for Jabez. That was the will of God for the Old Testament saints. If they would stay faithful to the law, stay faithful to the word, God would bless them. Israel was called out to be God's show and tell. This is what God desires. This is what he wants. And we're going to perform his acts. We're going to build a tabernacle, then a temple. We're going to do these certain sacrifices, these certain rituals, these certain washings, these certain offerings. We're going to do it like he said. And God said, if you'll do it like I said, with the right heart, because God sees the heart, the people see the action. Okay, That's why God has great difficulty with hypocrisy. God has difficulty with people who are doing the right actions, but their heart is not for him. But remember the faith that Paul heard of first, that you loved God, you had faith in God, and then you loved people. That's how our true walk ought to start and continue and finish. Loving God, being truly faithful to him, and then serving others. Serving God through serving others. And he says, I want you to be strengthened with all might. And we pray the power of God in our lives, and everything's about power today. Lord, give us the power. We want to see power. And they base everything on experience over presence. Uh, 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 an experience over here instead of sitting quietly in the presence of God. And the power of God taught in the scripture is found in his presence, his holy, quiet presence. You and him alone. That's where the power of God is. 
And the power of God is to save. The power of God is to give increase of spiritual blessing, of bounty, of fruit in your lives. And he says, I'm praying. He's continuing to pray. I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you. Paul's the guy that told us to pray without stopping. We need to pray this for one another. We need to read Colossians 1, 9 through 14 this week and pray this prayer for one another this week. As Paul prayed it for Colossae, as Paul's praying it for us, as the Spirit of God is leading us to pray for others, we must do it. He says that you'll be strengthened in all might according to his glorious power. Glorious power. Yeah, the glorious power of God. Zap you, zap you, zap you. Just like, uh, you know, uh, the people in the New Testament when they first saw these, the, the disciples doing some great things, man. Uh, the magician said, I want some of that, man. How much? I got to buy this? Just, you ain't buying the power of God, bro. You got a wicked heart in this thing. And what does Paul remind us that the power of God will do? It'll save souls. After this, you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me. You're going to be producing fruit through the power of God, and you'll be seeing souls save the ultimate fruit with the power of God. And what does Paul go on to tell us what else the power of God will do for us? Here's what the power of God will do. It's not going to get you stuff. It's not going to we're going to see great signs and wonders and miraculous things happening in your life. It's not going to do that. You know what it's going to do? It's going to give you patience in your tribulation. Because when you're walking with God, all they who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer tribulation and patience and persecution. And the power of God will give you patience in that walk. What this word patience here means is endurance. You won't be a quitter. You ever been around a bunch of quitters? People want to quit. Something go and gets tough and they just bail out and let's quit. God has zero room for quitters. That's why he says over and over, they that endure to the end, they that endure to the end, they that endure to the end. He's all about endurance. He's all about patience. Look at Job. That's why he loved Job. That's why he loved Noah. That's why he loved Daniel. Those three are powerful. What did they all have? Endurance. They gave it up. Noah, 120 years building a boat. You don't think that took endurance? With people laughing at him? Job, going through all this trouble, losing everything he had. The guru comes around, strikes his family, strikes his camel, strikes his donkey, strikes his, all his herds, kills his Servants wipes his family out with a wind, you know, a tornado that comes by. And then he has to go endure the pain, the misery, after the dying and the death and the thievery and the losing it all with a bickering wife in the background. It took him great patience to endure this thing. And God says, you know, I was really impressed with what Job did. Daniel did nothing wrong, 13-year-old kid. Why does God let bad things happen to good people? Because God's looking to test you in patience. Our, our view of blessing and blood is, is temporary, and God is all about eternity. Guys, if you can picture eternity for a second, past this little 70-year stint we call life, that's what God is looking at. This is the squeeze point. Life is the pressure point. Life is the furnace. Life is the getting the dross out, the garbage out, the dirt out of your life. It's the purification because God wants you ready for the next life because the way you die is the way you begin your eternity. If you die sucking on the milk of baby, blah, 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 that's how you begin your returning. You're going to miss out on the blessings that God intended you to have, just your starting point. God wants us to be as mature as we should be by the time we die. That should be your prayer. Lord God, here's my prayer. I don't want to be a baby. I don't want to walk backwards. I don't want to sit down. I don't want to be lazy. I don't want to displease you. I want to walk worthy of your word. I want you to be pleased in my worthy walk. Help me. I want to finish. I don't want to finish the greatest thing. I don't want to be above Paul or above Noah. I want to just be who you created me to be the day I was to die. I don't want nothing more. I desire nothing more. And I surely don't want nothing less. God, help me to finish the race the way you designed the race. I hope you're praying that every day for yourself. If you're not praying that every day for yourself, you haven't gotten a hold of this thing yet. But I pray you do today. I pray the Lord wakes you up and says, you know what? I need to be praying that. I need to be running my race, finish. Paul said, I kept the faith. I ran my race. I had patience. I finished my course, my course, the course that God had for me. You know where he was writing that from? A prison, getting ready to get his head lopped off. This is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. God I just wants you to be faithful where you are. And then by gimme, 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 God, oh, make my family great. Bless me. Give me big stuff, Lord. That's Old Testament. And if that was for the Jews... New Testament, what greater inheritance is there than God himself? 
You see, God did this for the people in the Old Testament because once a week they had to go to church and three times a year they were required to go to Jerusalem to church to meet up with God. And they really didn't get to meet up with him. They got to meet up with the man who met the man who met up with him. They got to give their offering to a priest who knew the high priest. They were in the same family of Levi who got to see God one day a year. That's why God blessed these people the way he did. Then we get saved. The Holy Spirit comes down. Now God dwells inside of me and he ain't enough. Come on, Lord, I need a house. I don't need you. I can't be satisfied with you. I want to be out of debt. Debt free. Now, God wants us out of debt. It's a command, command from his word, but not over him. See, a lot of us got in trouble while we were sinners. Amen? A lot of us sinned. We found ourselves in sin, and then Jesus Christ comes along and wakes us up, says, hey, you don't need to be doing this. You need to get this cleared up. You need to pay off your, all your debt. Don't be in debt to anything, anybody. The whole game of Satan is to get us all in debt so we can all go to debtor's prison when he's ready for him to open up. Did you know that? I pray it's after the rapture, but their game plan is to reopen debtor's prison. That's why they want you in so much debt. Can you use your credit card this Christmas? No, really, really. Use it big. When the Russians are telling us that this Christmas is when the U.S. dollar goes down. Just wrap that thing up to where you can't pay for it, okay? That's the will of Satan for our lives. The will of God is not things. The will of God is understanding that he is now in my life, the God of heaven. I don't have to go anywhere or do anything to have his awesome, enormous power in me and his relationship with me. I don't have to go shake hands with the guy who shakes hands with the guy who gets to see him once a year. I get to have him with me 24-7. And that has not become good enough for the entire church. Do you understand what's missing here? Do you understand what Laodicea is all about? We don't want God. We want things. We're not satisfied with what we have. Guys, you are filled with the Holy Spirit of God if you got saved. He is in you. He's all you need. If you would understand this fact, you would have a better life and better fruit production for God. Satan's come in with noise and things. He's crowding out the small, tender voice of God and blinding us to what we really have. The power of God, the joy of God, the presence of God in our lives to make us prepared for the next one. It's all about the next one. If you start focusing on this one, you don't even have a clue. Love not this world. Neither the things that are in this world. For all that's in this world, the love of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, the, it's going to pass away. But they that do the will of God abides forever. What's the will of God? What Paul's praying? That you'll have power in patience. Be patient. How many of you snap too quick? How many of you don't have patience? How many of you don't have endurance? How many of y'all want to quit? Don't quit, don't quit, don't quit, don't quit. God's looking, I'm praying for you to have endurance. I'm praying for you to have endurance. And long-suffering. Long-suffering is putting up with people who are messing with you. Those who despitefully use you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you. Because when you start walking God's way, when you start making him the focal point of your life, you will be living godly in Christ Jesus and you'll begin to become persecuted. If you're not being persecuted, your focus is wrong. I want to tell you that. If you're not being persecuted, you're not walking godly in Christ Jesus yet. And I'm praying that you will. Because all they who live godly in Christ Jesus, in Christ Jesus, that's the key, not Christ Jesus in me. Me in Christ Jesus, me abiding in him, his word, his faith, his hope, his feet, me sitting there. Faith, hope, and charity, man. That's what Paul writes about in, in Corinthians. It's all the way through the Bible. That's what we saw here. We saw, we saw the faith and we saw the charity. The hope is when God gives us the faith, we now have a hope. We have something to look forward to. Your hope is heaven. Your hope is the end of the line. That's why we sing the songs we sing in here. Looking for a city, I'm going home, we're traveling on, I'll fly away. It's not about here, it's about there. This is the journey, and I'm praying during this journey that you will have patience and endurance with joyfulness. you got to be joyful. There's a lot of people who suffer who are not joyful. There's a lot of people who will stick it out and they won't quit and they won't give up, but you're... Is that you? They want to down talk and be so whiny. God's called us to a different place. And if you're a Christian and you're not joyful in your tribulations, you are not walking with Jesus. You are not walking worthy of the vocation where you've been called. You're not walking worthy of the word. You're not walking worthy of the Lord Jesus. The verse we prayed, I'm praying that you will. I'm praying that you will. Like Paul prayed for Colossae. I pray for Jonesboro. I pray specifically for you, my friends, my family, that you'll endure 
that you'll have patience, long-suffering, with joyfulness. Verse 12. Giving thanks. Guys, the key to joy is giving thanks in the middle of your tribulation. Not praying, Lord, get me out of here. That, that's what we want to pray. We, we want to pray, Lord, get me out of my trouble, save me from all this junk, Jabez prayer. God says, I am not here to deliver you out of the mess. I'm here to walk with you in the mess. This is a whole new dynamic for the last 2,000 years. Jesus with us. Life is a mess. You're going to have trouble, and you're calling it on yourself the more faithful and pure you become. People hate Jesus. People hate light. Shut the lights out, man. They like it dark. Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil, and you come along with this bright light, Jesus Christ shining in. Shut the freaking lights out. What's your problem, man? You trying to wreck my buzz? I heard a rock and roller say that on stage one time. He's up there, big band come in, jamming, and all of a sudden the light do turn on the wrong light. You're like, shut the lights out, you trying to kill my buzz. That's the whole world. When you walk up, you're a buzz killer. And all you want to, all you are is joyful, you're loving, you're kind, you're refreshing, you're good. God's tickled with you. God's spirit's flowing through you, and they can't stand you for that. You're gonna suffer persecution. Thank God when it happens. Have our whole attitude change instead of complaining and looking down. Thank God he was able to suffer. Paul, shipwrecked three times. The rest of us would have said, Lord, please don't ever let that happen again. After the first time, I don't ever want to be shipwrecked again. Beaten with rods, Lord, if we can keep that from happening the first time, I'd love it. We want to walk on just this little plain path of safety. Ooh la la. Oh, Fantasyville. Oh, boy. And that ain't the Via Della Rosa God's walking. That means you ain't walking with him if that's the path you want to take. Did you know that? He says, no, we're walking the straight line. But, Lord, that's straight lines. That's a dark place. It's a hurtful place. It's filled with evil people, man. Right. I want those evil people saved. I want them having seen the light. They don't have to accept you and me right now. But they have to know about you and me right now. Let's bring it to him, bro. All right. So we walk faithfully, and we pray for thanksgiving. We pray to have joyful hearts. We pray for endurance. And when the power of God comes on you, you will have power to endure. You will have power in patience. You will have power to be joyful. And you will have power to thank God for everything you find yourself in instead of down-talking, down-playing, miserable. <laughs> Amen? Give me thanks to the Father, which hath made us suitable the only reason you're suitable and you can walk a worthy walk is because he's made you suitable through a declaration. You're unsuitable. You're unsuitable. You are a sinner today. You are on your way to a devil's hell. You make God sick. But he has a cross. And he came here and he died for you. And he's coming after you unless you get saved and change. His judgment is, is pretty thick. It's stout. He's coming with a vengeance. He's going to burn. He's going to bring fire. He's going to bring death. He's going to bring tribulation. If you'll read Revelation, you'll know what he's going to bring to everybody who rejects him. But before he brought Revelation, he brought us the cross. And right after the cross, he brought us that empty tomb. And with the story of if you'll accept what he did on that cross and what happened there, the power that he had over the grave and over death and over hell, that's the same power that's inside of us because he went away and sent us the same Holy Spirit that raised him from the dead. In us. And this power is not some superpower to escape all trouble. It's to give me endurance while I walk through trouble. It's to give me patience while I'm in the middle of this situation. It's to bring me joy while I'm there. And a thankful heart, man. And knowing it was God who made me suitable because I came to him and I don't do these great works to please God. And check this out, God. Watch my technique on this. You have no technique. Your dance steps stink. They're atrocious. God's the great dancer, and we just don't come close. He's made you suitable. He's called you his partner. Aren't you thankful for that? And when we come to the cross, we realize that Jesus Christ has saved us, man, just like the people of Colossae did. They had faith in the scripture that Jesus died for them, and it was they needed Jesus. They couldn't put up with their pagan works, their ritual rites. They couldn't put up with Christian plus paganism. They couldn't put up with the law. They couldn't put up with the Old Testament because they were in a new... Uh, phase now, a new working of the Holy Spirit, God dwelling in us, God dwelling in me, I'll take that, I'll believe, what do I do? Hey, you believe in his finished work at Calvary, you get saved, whoever calls on the name of the Lord and believes in his, his principles shall be saved, yes, I do that, and they had faith, and then they read their Bible and said, oh, I need to go share that with other people, I need to go love on other people, and they did just that, 
And now they're able to understand what this power is about. And Paul's writing them, here's what I'm praying for you while I'm in jail. So Paul has endurance, do you reckon? He's not going to pray for somebody else to have endurance in their prison if he ain't got endurance in his. Long-suffering in his prison, knowing he's about to die, the end for him does not look good. From the earthly view, from him it looks great. From him it looks great. When you walk with God enough, you're, you are ready to be at the finish line. You're ready to put away this world. You're ready to put away your past thoughts, your past life, everything that haunts you. That You shouldn't haunt us anymore. The devil tries to come back and haunt us with it. We, we rejoice in the fact that God made me suitable. He declared me righteous, man. He took all that sin, all my past, all my stuff on him and set me free. And that leads me to thanksgiving. That leads me to joy. That leads me to rejoicing. The devil will come and remind you of your stupidities and how you blew it in the past and how you did this lie there. and you. Uh, it's in the past. It's on Jesus, man. I don't know what sins you're talking about. He don't. It's all on him. I'm now covered in a brand new slate in the robe of righteousness. He has declared me suitable to walk worthy, suitable for the inheritance. Everything that belongs to Jesus belongs to me now. It doesn't, doesn't start when I die. It starts the minute I get saved. Because what happens when I get saved, the Holy Spirit of God comes in me as an earnest payment for all eternity. Here's the earnest payment. I will come back to redeem you to buy you back for, for eternity's sake. Right now we have the Holy Spirit in us, and the, the earnest here, the earnest, the down payment of our eternity is in us and then sealed so that down payment can't be taken away. Aren't you thankful for that? Aren't you grateful that he declared you suitable for the inheritance just because you believed in his only begotten son? And now he wants to seal you in with his spirit, and he wants to begin to good, do a good work in you and seal you with the Holy Spirit of God and bring you endurance, bring you patience, bring you long-suffering, bring you praise, bring you thanksgiving, bring you a thankful heart. Aren't you thankful for that? And he wants to seal all that inside you. He wants your heart overwhelmed with joy and love. Where it has to blow out of your mouth in conversation. It has to come out of your mouth in, in uh, not argument and not complaining and none of those things, but only in joy and love and peace and the fruit of the Spirit coming out. And through the works of your hands, our, whatsoever you do in word or deed, we say it with our mouths, we do it with our lives, this whole righteousness coming out that Jesus Christ has declared me suitable. Don't ever let the devil come and think that he's going to take that suitability away from you. You blew it. I'm sorry, you're no longer suitable. The Holy Spirit of God's in you, and He's going to keep reminding you that you're suitable, and you need to realign your ship and get right with Him and walk with Him. And Paul's praying that prayer. I'm praying it for you guys. Giving thanks to the Father, which hath made us suitable to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. That's the saints in heaven, the saints in glory. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of His dear Son. You've got to picture that you are a prisoner of death in hell. Satan has you bound through your sinfulness, through your past, through your life, through your being tied to this world, through your hating of God or disclaiming God or not wanting to have God. And you are in prison. And you are in a painful prison. And after this prison, you're going to hell forever and ever and ever and ever. And God loves you. And in the middle of your prison, in the middle of your darkness, you hear the gospel. And you believe and you call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, believing that his finished work at Calvary was everything. And you need to be saved from this darkness, from this present world, and from the eternal one later, Lord in hell. Please save me. And at that very moment, it's like he sends in the holy SWAT team. And they come in like a rapture. And boom, they find out where you are. Snatch you right away. Boom, immediately upon your belief in Jesus Christ, they snatch you out of darkness. And they tenderly sit you down in the land of light in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what that verse is saying. Who hath delivered us immediately, snatched us like a SWAT team out of the power of darkness as soon as we believe. And he translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. I declare you suitable. Go walk in the kingdom. Go walk in righteousness. Go walk in faith. Endure to the end. Be faithful. Follow my lead. Hear my voice. Do the things that I say. Paul's praying that you will. Others are praying that you will. For 2,000 years you've been prayed for. Jesus prayed for that in the garden, John 17. If you walk suitable, Lord, save them, protect them, guide them. Amen? And that's what he's doing. Aren't you thankful you've been snatched out of darkness? Aren't you thankful you've been translated already in the spirit world into his marvelous life? And soon there's going to be many of us who are going to be translated physically boom, into that very kingdom. Right now we walk by faith and not by sight, but very soon it's going to be by sight. And it's going to happen the same way. You, you and I were snatched out of the spiritual darkness, but we're still here in the middle of this wicked cesspool, the darkness that we call this world. 
One day God's going to physically snatch us out of here just like he did out of the spirit darkness. He's going to snatch us out of this physical darkness. He's going to take us away. Aren't you looking forward to that? That keeps us walking. That keeps us praising. That keeps us praying. That keeps us walking. No matter what trouble, what dungeon, what prison you find yourself in, you'll be praying for other people. Christianity ain't, Lord, save me from this dungeon in prison. I don't hear Paul praying that ever. Find me a Bible verse. Find me a Bible verse from the Pauline epistles where he was in prison writing, where he says, y'all, I've been in here for a moment. Can y'all pray for me to get out? Please pray for me to get out. That was Joseph in the Old Testament praying that before there was a Bible written. He was supposed to have prayed that. Uh, please, Butler, when you go back, can you tell him I'm here? Just get me out of here. Jeremiah. Can you please tell them, tell them to get me out of here? I'm dying in this dungeon. They did it. You don't hear Paul doing that. You don't hear the other guys who were suffering for Jesus. Lord, get me out of here. They were patient in tribulations. They were thankful for their tribulations because we're in a whole new paradigm right now. God in us. It's a wonderful thing. He never leaves me or nor forsake me. You can't take me to a prison dark enough, deep enough away from His presence. He overwhelms me there. We'll see people saved in prison. The only reason God's called you to prison is so the prisoners can get saved. So they can find what you've got. They're in a prison. They're, they went into that prison in darkness. You went in there in light and you introduced them to the light, Jesus Christ. Where we go is a great place when we're walking with the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't pray to get out of our troubles. We pray for grace and endurance to make it through our troubles. That's what God's calling us to do. That is godly in Christ Jesus. Don't pray to get out of your blight and all this stuff. God is burning the stuff off of you in the furnace. Let it happen. Let it happen to be thankful. As it happens, God has delivered us from the power of darkness spiritually. And he's translated us into the kingdom of his dear son spiritually. And very soon it's all going to take place in a rapture. Physically. Verse 14. In Jesus Christ, in whom we have the redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of every sin. Do not let the devil have you hanging on to your past. You have been snatched out of your past. Over here in a whole new realm where your past doesn't exist. Amen. It's all from the time you receive the Lord Jesus Christ and you're walking down the Via Della Rosa now all the way to your death date or the rapture date and you're looking unto Jesus, you're walking solid with Him, you're bringing people alongside you in salvation. See, this is Christianity, guys. Don't let the world, don't let television, don't let televangelists get it wrong with you. When you read your Bible, you'll read what we preach today to be the absolute truth. Jesus Christ has called you into trouble because he's troubled. Remember what they did to him, right? Remember what his own boy did to him? His, his faithful disciple walked with him for three and a half years. One denied him and one betrayed him. <coughs> he, he, he had some pain in his midsection, in his, in his world, in his small little group. It's going to happen. Christians are going to talk bad about you. You walk faithful. And the more faithful you walk, the worse it'll get. Walk faithful anyway. You know where Jesus is. You know what's the light. You know the next step. God's calling you. You be faithful. And you pray for those who despitefully use you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for the Lord's sake. Because you're in good company. That's where God has us. That's where God wants us. Keep walking. What's God talking to you about today? You're saved. You got the faith. You got hope. What's the blessed hope? The, the hope is, we read the Bible, it says something, we say yes, and we look to it, not in a wishful hope. That, that's what Satan has turned the word hope into. It's like, I, I, I hope. I, 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 there's, uh, there's more doubt here than a surety. Uh, that's not the Bible definition of hope. The Bible definition of hope is 100% assurity. The Bible said it, 100% assurity, and now we're looking for it. Blessed hope. We're look, the truths, all truths of Scripture are a blessed hope. Because the truth is Jesus. Jesus is the truth. If you find it in Scripture, it's truth. It's going to happen just like the Scripture says it. And you have blessed hope toward it, man. And we look for it. And faith sees it, realize now faith is the substance of things hoped for, evidence of things not seen. We read it in the Bible. We have a hope. We look for it. We look for it. And it materializes in our life. Answered prayers. Answered prayers. Answered prayers. Faith. 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 And that's how we live daily. God's calling you to a place of faith. God's calling you to a holy walk. God's called you to whatever He's called you to do. Right now, it's us walking together. Let's encourage one another. Let's pray for one another. As Paul did the church of Colossae, and as he read the letter uh, to Colossae, as they read it themselves to the congregation, they weren't the only ones that read it. We're reading it. Those letters were passed around to all the churches. Oh, Paul's praying for Colossae. We need to pray for them too. Galatians, Paul's praying for the folks of Galatia. We need to pray for them too. Pray for one another. Pray for all the churches here in Jonesboro, Arkansas. Many of them have been led astray. 
Many of them can't decipher between the Old and New Testament. Many of them can't decipher in the covenant of Old and the covenant New. Many of them don't know Jesus. Many of them aren't sitting at His feet. Many of them aren't trusting in the fact that He's declared them suitable. They're trusting in, uh, was I baptized? Did I, did I keep the law enough? They're trying to do it themselves. Pray that they'll wake up. Pray that they'll have faith. Pray that they'll have joy. Pray that they'll have endurance. Pray that they'll know God and love people. Pray that for yourself first. Paul wouldn't write in this letter to have these people do it if he wasn't doing it. Paul did it first, and then he prayed for them. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Walk worthy of the calling he's declared. He's declared you suitable. Walk suitably.